elbow pain, lateral epicondylitis, lateral epicondylalgia, or just classic tennis elbow. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, the overused injury that's commonly known as tennis elbow. Uh, generally, that's related to an eccentric overload of the common extensor tendon at the lateral epicondyle. Uh, you've got your extensor carpal radialis longus that comes off of there, extensor carpal radialis brevis, your extensor digitorum, your extensor uh, digiti minimi, I think, comes off of there, and your extensor carpal ulnaris all come off of that common extensor uh, origin at that lateral epicondyle. It's a loaded and repeated gripping, uh, usually causes it, uh, usually commonly with some wrist extension as well, and that's one of your most frequent mechanisms. It's previously been described as an inflammatory process, and the term lateral epicondylitis is uh, still commonly used. But is that the right term? Is that really what we should be calling it? Uh, most of the research says that that is not the right term and that uh, we're typically using that word epicondylitis uh, signifying inflammation. We're using that incorrectly. So how do we know that? Well, the histological findings that, that uh, researchers do, that surgeons do, uh, they frequently report an absence of inflammation and really describe it as more of a degenerative process as opposed to an actual acute inflammatory process. According to Buchanan and Vercalo in two, 2021, so very recently, tennis elbow is primarily, primarily a degenerative overuse process of the extensor carpal radialis brevis and the common extensor tendon. Aside from degenerative changes, the histological findings include granulation tissue, micro rupture, an abundance of fibroblasts, uh, vascular hyperplasia, unstructured collagen, and a notable lack of traditional inflammatory cells such as macrophages, lymphocytes, and neutrophils within the tissue. Multiple studies have reported histological findings of pathologic extensive carpal radialis brevis specimens, and they all describe a lack of inflammatory cells. So some researchers say that there may be some acute inflammation initially when uh, you start having this elbow pain, but that acute inflammation only lasts for like one or two weeks, and then it transitions into this degenerative process, uh, and the inflammation actually stops, and then it's just more of a degeneration issue in the area. You know, regardless of the pathophysiology, dry needling is a pretty useful tool to have in your tool belt when you're going to treat a traditional tennis elbow. Uh, the study uh, in 2021 that compared dry needling with corticosteroid injection is actually a pretty interesting study uh, for the treatment of lateral epicondylalgia. They actually found dry needling to be more effective than a corticosteroid injection. We better be careful and not tell our uh, orthopedic surgeons that because uh, they may lose that office visit. However, uh, you know, dry needling is less invasive than a corticosteroid injection. You have less chance of, uh, you know, fat atrophy, less chance of skin discoloration when uh, you look at dry needling as opposed to uh, a corticosteroid injection. So some of the muscles that you can consider when you're thinking about dry needling for tennis elbow, uh, they could just include those muscles in that common extensor tendon. So like your extensor carpal radialis longus, your extensor carpal radialis brevis, your extensor digitorum, your extensor carpal ulnaris. Uh, and you could also include the triceps because the triceps has a pretty uh, well-established pain referral pattern by Travell and Simons that goes to the lateral elbow. So I always include triceps when I'm including treatment for tennis elbow. And then for chronic tennis elbow, uh, chronic epicondylalgia, uh, you could do something called periosteal dry needling. And that's at the tenoosseous junction of that common extensor tendon. So you can basically take your needle and you can peck on the actual lateral epicondyle to create a little bit of an inflammatory process to restart the inflammatory process uh, when, you, when you're dealing with a chronic issue. So I'll show you how to do that as well. So this should be interesting. Uh, don't consider this a protocol. Don't think that this is just 100% the way that every time you treat tennis elbow, you need to stick these six needles in this form because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to give you an example of what uh, some needle setups could look like. So what a, a needle setup could look like for tennis elbow, including the triceps. You don't have to stick all, all four in the forearm and then two in the triceps every time. But this gives you an idea of what a combination of needles could look like. And then it's kind of interesting to see uh, what we can do with the needle at the uh, common extensor origin at the lateral epicondyle, how you can just peck on that origin to create a little bit of microtrauma. So that's kind of interesting to look at as well. So hopefully this will be helpful as you treat your uh, tennis elbow patients, regardless of whether uh, it's an itis or an alga. Uh, hopefully this will be helpful for you. You've probably heard it before, but I gotta say it again. This demonstration is intended as a resource for previous students and licensed clinicians who can perform dry needling in the practice act and jurisdiction. Please do not attempt dry needling without proper licensure and training. Some precautions to consider in this area include the deep branch of the radial nerve, the lateral anabraco cutaneous nerve, your superficial radial nerve, your radial artery and vein, the radial collateral artery and the radial nerve for the triceps, the nerve vascular bundle in the inner arm for the triceps, roughly a 30 to a 40 millimeter for the wrist extensors, 40 to 60 millimeter for the triceps, and a 15 millimeter for the periosteal pecking technique. 
The heuristic sensors that we're going to need will share a common origin at the lateral epicondyle. You can identify the ECRL with a wrist extension and wiggling your second digit, ECRB with wrist extension and wiggling your third digit, extensor digitorum. Just keep a neutral wrist and wiggle all your fingers. And then with the extensor carbonaris, you can identify with ulnar deviation. Obviously, you'll maintain a clean technique. You'll always use gloves, always use an alcohol wipe down to the site of treatment just to keep your area clean and safe. And then to needle the tissue, you just bracket the tissue to be treated at the lateral forearm, and you'll insert the needle from lateral to medial, uh, just into the tissue in between your fingers, roughly a 30 to a 40 millimeter needle, depending on the size of the arm. And then the technique is pretty much the same as you, as you progress through the lateral aspect of the forearm. Neurovascular is less concerning as you get more lateral, uh, but again, the technique is the same, lateral to medial uh, into the tissue at the lateral wrist extensors. And then for the triceps, of course, you'll perform an alcohol wipe down to the site of treatment, and then you can identify with an isometric elbow extension. Uh, and the treatment setup you see in just a minute will perform this in the seated position, but right now you see it in the sideline position. But you just grasp the tissue of the triceps and insert your needle, roughly uh, anywhere from a 40 to a 60 millimeter needle, depending on the size of the arm, uh, and grasp the tissue and insert the needle uh, from a lateral to medial direction into the tissue that's in between your fingers. And now you can see a tennis elbow treatment setup that includes the forearm extensors and the triceps uh, at a continuous wave frequency, roughly 2 to 4 hertz, for about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, with intensity set to patient tolerance. And now we'll look at a periosteal dry needling technique, a periosteal pecking. So you identify the lateral aspect of the uh, lateral epicondyle, then you obviously perform an alcohol wipe down to that treatment site. And then you'll tap your needle in, we're using a 15 millimeter needle, so obviously a very small needle. And then we'll uh, insert the needle to where it hits the lateral epicondyle, which is the origin of the common wrist extensor tendons. And then uh, we'll do an oscillating technique, just a little pecking technique uh, to various aspects of that lateral epicondyle. So you can see the needle uh, changing directions from uh, you know, one direction to another in kind of a conical pattern just throughout that entire lateral epicondyle. Basically what we're trying to do is just create a little bit of inflammation, create a little bit of micro bleeding, create just a little bit of tissue trauma to the area to try to re reactivate the inflammatory process.